group. And uh, take it away, please. Okay, thank you very much. So, so thank you for, for inviting me to this, to this seminar. I'm looking forward to explain to you what we have been doing on, on this topic uh, on conceptual blending and how we have been applying uh, some ideas of category theory that we took from the inspiration that we took from Joe Gogan in, in order to model uh, the conceptual blending. Uh, now, this to, to put a little bit into 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 context. Uh, this this um, this work has been done in the context of a European project called Coinvent, which I I happen to coordinate. And uh, in this project, what we were looking for was um, a, to provide a computationally feasible cognitively inspired formal model of how we invent concepts, how we invent new concepts. And for this, we draw from the um, from a theory of cognitive science uh, called conceptual blending. And in this project, we wanted to provide a proof of concept in a couple of, of testbed scenarios. One was in the invention of mathematical ideas and mathematical reasoning, and the other was in, in the harmonization of melodies. So, so within this context, we explored this, uh, this mathematical model of uh, conceptual blending. Now, a little, bit, uh, a little bit about what conceptual blending is. So conceptual blending was proposed by uh, Gilles Fauconnier and Mark Turner as a fundamental cognitive operation that underlies very much the way we think and how we use language. So it developed mainly in the area of cognitive linguistics. And uh, somehow what conceptual blending uh, tries to explain is this process that uh, we do with humans when we combine particular elements and relations that we take from originally two separate areas, two separate mental spaces, they call, but that share some common structure. And then these uh, mental spaces are blended into a new space, the blended space, in which uh, new elements and relations can emerge and new inferences can be drawn. And uh, in, in, for example, in the book, this book that they have written, the way we think, they describe many, many different kinds of examples of these kind of conceptual blending. Uh, let me give you one of, of these examples that have been used in, in the literature on conceptual blending. Uh, to describe the basic elements that, that concept, conceptual blending has. So imagine the idea of uh, the surgeon as a butcher. So the idea then when somebody says, this surgeon is a butcher. This is a blend. This is a conceptual blend of two different mental spaces. One is the mental space of the surgeon and this mental space has a certain structure, certain elements that, that we think about when we think about a surgeon as the person that does the cutting of another person that is the, has the role of a patient. This other person may, is, is obviously alive and, and this cutting is done usually with a scalpel, an instrument that is sharp and small, and it does in it, it it is done with a certain precision and obviously the surgeon does it with a certain objective which is the healing of the patient so all these aspects are let's say the mental space of the surgeon but this mental but the fact that we are talking now of a, of a surgeon as a butcher brings also in the mental space of the, um, of the butcher, where it is 
it is it is a person with the role of a butcher that is cutting an animal and uses an a sharp, also a sharp instrument but this one is a big one the the cleaver and uh, and we have the idea that this cutting is done in a more r rough way no? there's a certain roughness in this cutting and obviously with a different objective and 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 what we are doing is with respect to an animal that is uh, that is uh, that is dead and that is used as a commodity right so 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 these two things are blended together because they share some structure we put into there is a cross space relation between certain structure between these two spaces we have the 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 fact that we are relating the the surgeon with the with the butcher the scalpel with the cleaver uh, the the person that plays the role of a pers uh, person we are uh, relating it with the animal uh, and these cross space relationship actually what they represent is some uh, uh, some uh, common structure that these two mental spaces have which is usually in the theory of conceptual blending called the generic space so so in this generic space we have this common structure and this common structure um, is then what we use to uh, to combine these things together to create this new blended space now what the theory of conceptual blending also says is that uh, when we do these blends uh, so certain clashes also appear and this these clashes is that allow us then to use these conceptual blending in in creative ways right so in this case when we when we blend these things together obviously we take certain things of one side for example uh, we we bring into the blended space the cleaver not the scalpel okay so that we have this sharp and big instrument and maybe also the idea of the roughness of the cutting but from uh, from the other side we bring the patient the person that is alive you know and uh, and 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 obviously these these aspects that are not from the lecture and that come from one side and the other or the other side and that have this contrast that we are now uh, contrasting things that were on one side dead with the other side alive or one side that was precision on one side or roughness in the other make that now in this blend we can express certain things like that uh, we see this uh, this surgeon as uh, as an incompetent person that that works as a butcher right and 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 that's the idea of that in the theory of conceptual blending is very much explored how we how this combination is done and how these conflicts are resolved so that we can express something new and uh, new emergent uh, structure appears in these conceptual blends so that's that's the idea of the conceptual blend and um, joe gogan obviously said well then a good model to 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 uh, explain this idea of conceptual blending could be done with category theory why because uh the the what a mental space is is actually not something that is very clearly defined in the theory of conceptual blending it is just vaguely described but what is described in much uh, in, in, in what really this tells what the conceptual blending is is more how these concept how these mental spaces are related so that they are related through a generic space and that they are combined in some way and that and that we have these projections between the general the, the generic space and the mental space so so that makes us think that that uh, a category theoretic approach where you put the emphasis on on the mappings and on the morphisms and on the arrows more than on the objects themselves would be a natural way to model the idea of conceptual blending and uh, and obviously the, the the obvious idea is to take the idea of um, of a co-limit to explain this combination of things right and and um, 
following the idea of Joe Gogan that uh, when we combine things together to create something uh, that takes the combination of these things, the natural way is to do it with a colimit. And also to, to quote um, uh, Phillips and Wilson, uh, this idea to do it through category theory is a way to, is also useful to reconceptualize uh, things that have been modeled in, in cognitive science, where instead of now thinking about the structures of these mental spaces and how these structures are combined, the emphasis is put on the relationships on, uh, that exist between these mental spaces. And without getting into committing of what exactly these mental spaces is, but explaining the conceptual blending or other, con or other cognitive Cognitive in, in this perspective. And this is something, this perspective is something that we liked as well, and that we thought that it would be nice to further explore with the initial ideas of Gogan how we could model conceptual blending and particularly how to implement that in, in, um, in computers so that we can simulate or emulate conceptual blending in a, in a very mathematically precise uh, way. Uh, so, so the, the, the idea is obviously very simple. What are our mental space are just objects of a category. So we have these two mental spaces, I and J. This would be the objects that, um, that we want to, to blend. And, um, and then the way to represent these cross space relations between these two spaces would be using a span and using this generic space that, uh, and these two arrows to describe that this is how these two relate through some generic space. Fair enough. And then the, obviously the, the easiest thing is a blend is just a cocoon. That would be just how do we combine these two objects together in a new object that respects the shared structure that is described in the generic space. Okay, so, so that would be the simple approach to model a blend as a cocoa. And obviously an optimal blend we could say is then what would be in this case a push out. And uh, this push out would then represent the way to optimally combine these things, preserving the structure that is given in the, in ge in the generic space. So, so that would be the, 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 the intuitive, naive approach to, to model conceptual blending uh, using category theory. But um, uh, it, has, it is not entirely good. There are certain um, things that, uh, that this idea does not capture from the description of conceptual blending that we see in the literature uh, done by Fauconi and Turner, for example. And uh, one thing is that, for example, it does not describe the idea of selective projection. So if, if you remember the case of the surgeon and the butcher blend, uh, some things from one side come into the blend, some things from the other side come into the blend. Uh, but uh, of, while we are respecting the shared structure, not everything from one side and the other side is put into the blend. So, so these projections are are selective, are partial, okay? Then the other thing is that it doesn't capture this emergent structure that, that, that the, the whole literature of conceptual blending explains, how, how new structure arises in this blend. And finally, uh, if we only focus on optimal blends as pushouts, and we have that pushouts are unique up to isomorphism, then we cannot think about uh, uh, com comparable alternative optimal blends uh, and and maybe that is not that does not capture the idea that sometimes two mental spaces can be combined in in different ways that are incomparable and um, and therefore the 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 approach that joe gogan uh, um, uh, offered is um, to, uh, to tackle particularly these two aspects that I, my, um, uh, I explained here in red, use 
emerging um, uh, ordered categories. The, 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 the aspect of emergent structure can always capture it if we focus only on co-cones and not only on, on, on co-limits, and we, ca we allow additional structure to be added on it. But the other things, the selective projection and the, in the incomparable alternatives is something that Gauguin suggests to explore with ordered categories. That is when we have a, a partial order on the, on the arrows of the category, on the home sets between two objects. Um, if we move to ordered categories, and we think now that we have certain order on arrows so that we can talk about uh, arrows that project more or project less into the blend, and therefore we have some order on them. Then if we use the standard notion of limit and co-limit in ordered categories, it seems to be an inadequate notion because uh, one of the properties that limits and co-limits have in order categories is that don't they, they don't preserve the order of arrows. And uh, that's why a weaker notion, which is, has been proposed in ordered categories, which is the, with the name of, uh, well, there are several names in the literature. I settled with the name that Jay was suggesting, which is the name of a near co-limit or near limit, where uh, the idea, the notion of uh, commutation is replaced with semi-commutation using the partial order of the ordered category. Okay, so so the the idea is that um, what we ask are not not cocoons anymore, but lux cocoons. That is when we ask for these semi commutation in 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 these uh, triangles, and uh, then the the near push out is also when we ask that uh, if there is another lux cocoon then there is an arrow between the two apexes that also semi-commutes and uh, we are looking for the maximal arrow in the partial order that uh, that satisfies this property okay joe gogan has called this a three and a half three halves push out because he co all, called his ordered categories three half uh, categories because they lie in between uh, normal categories and two categories, and um, uh, but I will use the the term of near push up that uh, Barry J has suggested. So so the idea is to model blends with these near push outs instead of uh, with push outs in an ordered category, so that. Uh, this solves these modeling problems that, that I was mentioning before. So on one side, we have that we can talk about selective projection now, taking, taking into account this partial order on the morphisms, uh, and that the aspect of the incomparable alternative blends now is also somehow solved because near pushouts are not unique anymore uh, up to isomorphism. So we can have different incomparable uh, near pushouts. And this is actually seen as, um, as, a pod as positive or a good uh, attribute or characteristic, because that's also what happens with, with conceptual blends, that we might have several different kinds of conceptual blends. Uh, so the suggestion is, uh, let's use near pushouts to model conceptual blending in an ordered category. The problem though, is that uh, now things have complicated a little bit more and there's no so much computational support for near pushouts in ordered categories. Uh, it would be better if we would have some notion in, in, in plain categories that could be similar to that of a near pushout, uh, because then we could use uh, um, reasoning and computational tools that exist to, to implement these ideas. And, uh, and that's what we have been exploring in this, in this uh, European project. And, and we have our own proposal to modeling conceptual blend, which somehow uh, takes the idea of Gauguin, but tries to see if we can use that just in plain categories. And uh, the, the, the obvious way is to look 
at the, as these arrows of, a, uh, of an ordered category as uh, partial arrows. That is arrows that consist, that are actually a span of two arrows. Uh, so a partial arrow where we took this, the, the domain of the arrow of this as the sub uh, the sub object that is the domain of the arrow so the i sub zero would be the sub object of i with this monomorphism that is um, the domain of the arrow and then we have an, a, a standard total arrow these partial arrows which are also monospans uh, which are spans where we have one mono monomorphism on one of these two arrows that is the uh, the the category we take now the category of uh, of partial arrows and then uh, and then the lax cocoon that models the the conceptual land would be seen using these uh, these category of partial arrows if we look in this way then um, then what we need is that to be a category we need to define the composition of these um, of these partial arrows and that we can do if uh, we have inverse images so we if we can have pullbacks of monos so that we can compose um, one arrow another arrow computing the pullback so that we can have the composition and it is it's again a partial arrow this category which is the category of partial arrows uh, on, on C, is usually defined uh, uh, by fixing uh, a, a class of monomorphisms that we allow to be used as the monomorphisms of these monospans. And uh, this is usually called a realm, and they, uh, we ask them to, to be stable so that they have pullbacks, closed under composition and, and, uh, and isomorphism. And when we fix that realm, then we call this M petal C, the category of partial arrows, when these monos of the monospans that represent the partial arrows are taking only of this realm M. And then obviously the home sets of these of the of partial arrows are naturally ordered by the subject subobject ordering of the domains, and this makes this M petal C an ordered category. If we are in this situation, then the lax cocoon that we have in this category of partial arrows, uh, if we uh, if we if we focus on those lax cocoons that happen when we are talking about conceptual blending, then it doesn't make very much sense to have partial arrows down here because this, this, to, this span down here is the span that came out from our cross space correspondence. And that we usually can be expressed with, with total arrows. So if this is a total arrow and uh, we, and then we build a, or we define a lax cocoon in the category of partial arrows, where we ask that these arrows of this diagram here, of this V diagram are total, then this is the cases that we have usually in conceptual blending, which is um, the, 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 the case that we will focus now and that we will see how, how we can develop further. If I, re I, if, if I redraw this little diagram a little bit, just moving the things, then what we can see is that it is just, what we are just doing is we have an initial V diagram that represents our cross uh, space relation. And we generalize it a little bit, or we, we take sub objects of these three objects there. And these, Three subobjects are then the ones that are combined together into the into the blended space. So 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 that's the idea that is happening when we are focusing on that particular case. The thing is that what is the diagram that we have here exactly? So in general, what we have here is a, a V diagram that arises by 
taking the pullback here on this side, taking the, the pullback on that side, and then making the union of these two objects so that, so that these V diagram describes the relationship that exists when we have taken the input space and we have taken a subobject of it. We have taken this input space and taking a subobject of it. And then what we do is how, how then these, uh, how are these related so that when we put them together, we get the blend. Okay. And that actually is very similar to an idea that uh, Santiago Antañón and Enrique Plaza uh, did a while ago in the area of case-based reasoning, which was called an amalgam, which is not to do with amalgamation in category theory, but it has this name of amalgam. And the idea that uh, they explored is uh, when we want to combine two things, two, two cases in case-based reasoning to generate a new case, sometimes we need just to generalize a little bit one case, generalize a little bit another case, and then combine the generalizations. And uh, this is what they called an amalgam. What we did is we took this idea and we gave a category theoretical account in, in uh, that somehow was very similar to the, the idea of near pushouts. Because what we had is that the near, the near pushout seen in a category of partial arrows looked very much the same as the amalgam uh, viewed more in category theoretic terms. And that, that, that is what we explored a little bit more. So, so, so the, the, the question, is, the idea was that we started off this diagram that explained the cross space relationship between the two input spaces. And now we make a generalization of this V diagram this generalization of this diagram is determined by these monomorphisms here. And these two monomorphisms, what they uh, determine is this W diagram that is then put together in a normal, with a normal co-limit. So, so, so that is that this Lux cocoon that we had before, can be can be seen also as a generalization of a diagram and then doing a um, and then just computing a normal colimit. And so so the question is, what was exactly the relationship between these amalgams and the near pushouts that we have? So what we wanted to know is if uh, we have um, if we have an amalgam which is in a, in a plain category, which is some think in between a cocoon and a pushout. And we have in ordered categories, something that is uh, a near pushout, but a particular near pushout because it's a near pushout of a cross space relation. So when we have total arrows in the V diagram, is there any relationship between these two? And uh, so we proved a couple of theorems and this is probably where I am less satisfied because I'm not a category theorist. And so, so when, we, when I tried to prove the relationship between near pushouts and amalgams, uh, and I couldn't find the proof, I had to tweak a little bit here and there and put properties here and there so that everything works fine. And, and that's the result that I have. Maybe some more interesting... Uh, um, description can be fine fine uh, can be found but i have not been able to found anything more than what i that what uh, what we said in our paper and it and and that is that when we are in a category with a real n and uh, and this category has images then what we have is that if we take a V diagram and in the ordered category of the partial arrows of C, when these two arrows that of the V diagram are total arrows, then the, the apex that we get 
of these near push out is the apex of an amalgam when we look at it as C objects and not as M M pital, M pital C objects. Okay, so 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 that means that um, uh, sorry, uh, the other way around. If we have an amalgam, then it is a near push out. So then, if we have an amalgam in C, then we have a near push out in M pital C. Okay, so so we can prove that every amalgam that we described in C will be a near push out in M pital C. Uh, the other way around, uh, I could only prove it if, uh, if we say that C is finitely co-complete and a balanced category. That is when we have that uh, when an arrow is an epimorphism and a monomorphism, it is also an isomorphism. When we, have, when we are in this situation, then we, we can prove that if we take a near push out in the category of partial arrows as an ordered category, then this near push out is also an amalgam when we look at in the plane category of C. Uh, from a generalization, so there's a generalization of the V diagram to a W diagram that makes it, and when we do the collimit of this W diagram, then this collimit is also the near push out in the, in the, in the category of partial arrows. So we have these two theorems. So we have some sort of relationship between amalgams and near pushouts. And, uh, and uh, this would be uh, the theoretical result that allows us to take the idea of near pushouts as a model of conceptual blending in ordered categories, but to use the tools that we can the computational tools that we can uh, have uh, working with plane categories, because now we compute the near pushouts using amalgams. The idea is, as we said, we, as I said before, we have this diagram, these V diagram, and now what we explore is generalizations of this diagram. So, so, so the idea is to implement, uh, to, re, to do a search space of how we can generalize or how, how, what are the monomorphisms that you can find here or the generalizations that we can find from A and from J. Uh, and, and then uh, using these generalizations to construct this W diagram and compute the co-limit. And that gives us the that would gives us an apex, which is the near push out, and would be the blend of the um, of 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 these two initial initial mental spaces and how they were related. Uh, and uh, having these uh, this way to explore and or, or to 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 compute these blends. Um, we have uh, explored it with different kinds of uh, representation formalisms for for these mental spaces or for these conceptual spaces okay and the idea is that all of them follow this idea of computing an amalgam to represent a blend and uh, so 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 i will uh, mention three uh, uh, blending where we are where our objects are typed feature structures blending when our objects are concept descriptions in a description logic, and blending when these objects are specifications in the common algebraic specification language, CASA, okay? So, so in all these cases, we have done some implementations of, of, of the computation of amalgams that would be the computation that can be seen as the computation of these near pushouts. Uh, I will explain the example with with feature structures because um, it will uh, uh, I, I can explain with this example everything that I've uh, said before in general terms using uh, category theory. So imagine that what we have is we we use a feature structure formalism to represent icons. Feature structures were were used in the nineties and. Um, and this is, for example, a um, this would could be, for example, the feature structure that represents this icon. Okay. Another way to represent feature structures is also with so, these so-called feature terms, 
which would be a generalization of first order terms where we have not a fixed arity, but uh, uh, the arguments are labeled, which are these features. And uh, and the and and the and the values of the arguments are sorts, okay. And uh, these and then what we have, for example, here is that we have an icon that has two features: a left side and a right side. And all these two two sides, we have a silhouette. And then the silhouette has a has one one silhouette that has one feature, which is that on the right it has a right arrow. And the silhouette here has also a feature that says that on the left it has a right arrow. Somehow to represent that this right this right arrow is on the right of one silhouette is on the left on the other. Okay, so so that would be a feature structure of representing, for example, this icon. Now imagine uh, and, and, and now this would be the objects of our category: feature structures or feature terms. And uh, the morphisms is just subsumption of feature structures. And, and, a, and, a, and a feature structure subsumes another one if uh, it is, let's say, more general or less informative than the, the other feature structure. Or if there's a graph homomorphism between these feature structures and uh, that, that map more general sorts to more specific sorts. Okay, here we have a sort hierarchy for going from the most specific to the most general in the bottom. So, so the, the less informative in the bottom, the more informative in the, in the top. And, um, and we see that arrow, we, uh, uh, um, we, right arrow, so, so this feature structure subsumes the other feature structure. So if we take as arrows of our category subsumption and uh, the objects are the feature structures, then we can think about uh, what this has, what this uh, gives us to the, to the theory, what, what this means for the, our items in this category, okay? And if they would be uh, near pushouts. Now, what we have is that uh, um, this category the, of feature structures with subsumption it has images, but is not balanced. Uh, feature, feature structure unification is the pushout construction in F, but F in general is in general not co, uh, not co complete. We have that F has pullbacks and is bounded complete, so that we can the, take the whole class of F arrows as our real. And um, and this makes the the partial the, the 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 category of partial arrows of F an ordered category, and this means that the amalgams in F will be near pushouts in Pitl F. So it is a good model to 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 compute. Uh, Conceptual blends, if they, if we want to capture, if they have to be near pushouts, but because it's not a balanced category, uh, there there could be near pushouts that uh, would not correspond to a to an amalgam. Okay, so at least we will everything that we will compute will be near pushouts, but maybe we will miss some of them. So that's what we what we know if we focus on feature structures. And here's a particular example. What would that mean? So imagine we have these two icons and we want to blend them. We want to create a new icon out of these two. Uh, uh, here is the feature structure representation of one icon and here's the other feature structure of, of the other icon. Now, what is the common structure of these two icons? The common structure of these two feature structures is given by the anti-unification, which is the most specific feature structure that subsumes these two. Okay, and the anti-unification, the anti-unification taking into account this this hierarchy of sorts, would be this one. So, so. Uh, a one where we specifying that there's an arrow between these two silhouettes, but we don't know which kind of arrow it is. If it is a left arrow or it's a right arrow. That's the, the anti-unifier. 
And that is would be the role of our generic space, the generic space that represents the common structure of these two structures, of these two feature structures. So now we have our V diagram, and now we want to compute a, a blend uh, that would be a, a, an amalgam of these two. It cannot be uh, the unifier. We cannot unify these two terms because right arrow and left arrow are uh, two dif distinct sorts, and we cannot find a, un a unifier of these two. Therefore, because there's no unifier, we explore a generalization space. So we 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 look at uh, generalizations of these terms uh, and see if we can blend together these generalizations. For example, one way to generalize would be that we get rid of one of the features of the feature structure. And now we are saying that this right arrow is to the right of the of one of the silhouettes, but uh, we don't specify that this is also the arrow that is on the on the left of the other silhouette. Okay, uh, something similar could be done on the other side. Okay. So this would be general. Uh, this would be two possible generalizations, but obviously there's a whole space of generalizations possible. Now, with respect to this two. Uh, we can do the blend. The anti-unifier of these two would be this feature structure. But this feature structure does not capture really the, the, the relationship that exists between these two. It is much better to construct this W diagram by creating the, the pullback of one side and the pullback of the other side. And then we have this W diagram that, re, that describes the um, that describes how these different structures are related. So, so that would be this W diagram that we get from the generalization. And this would be the diagram on, on over which we compute the co-limit. And the co-limit that we, that we get is this feature structure, which somehow is one of the blends that you can get, but you can get many. So it's, we have not uniqueness anymore, but we can have different incomparable blends, that would be one. So one possible way to combine these two icons and to create a new icon would be to have uh, a, an icon that represents uh, with, with these two arrows, one on the left and the other on the right, which is not the unification of these two. It's, it is the, the blend, the amalgam of these two. Or if we look at in the category of partial arrows, it would be a near push out, okay? Uh, so, so, so that is the that is an example of of a, an amalgam in the category of feature structures. Now, blending with concept descriptions is done in the in a similar way. We have explored it, where now we look at objects as descriptions in a particular description logic. In this case, we looked at a very lightweight description logic called EL++, which is also the one that is used in one of the profiles of the OWL language, of the, of the, of the web ontology language. And um, we implemented operators that generalize these descriptions so that we can explore the, the, the space of generalizations. We've implemented it with an answer set programming, and then we computed the, the combinations. And uh, for example, one example, also illustrating it with icons again, is imagine that we have concept descriptions to describe particular classes of icons. And what we want is to combine the, um, an icon of, a, of the, that represents a magnifying glass over a hard disk with an icon of, um, of a document that has a pen. And what we want is take a little bit of one and a little bit of the other to make a new icon. Then we also do it through a generalization of these icons using some kind of ontology of concepts that we have in, given in description logic. And, uh, and then uh, making the combination of these two. Now, these, this is again modeled as an amalgam, but it's a very particular amalgam in that case, because now these generalizations that we do 
are generalizations that factor through the arrows that we have in the V diagram. So if this, this, mono, this monomorphism that we were using here factors through these arrow here, then what we have is not a generalization from a V diagram to a W diagram, but we are just generalizing the two input spaces, but we are keeping the same gen generic space. Okay, so this is a particular kind of amalgam that that happens when, as I said, these instead of having these general uh, amalgam, when these monomorphisms factor through these arrows here, then these three objects that we have here and this one are all isomorphic, and so that they collapse to one object, and then what we have is what we call a bounded amalgam, which is a particular kind of amalgam that we happen happen in this happen, we have in this category of concept descriptions. Okay. And that simplifies a little bit more the, the, the computation of the amalgam. Uh, and many of the of the blends that we have modeled actually are uh, bounded amalgams. Uh, the ones with the feature structure was one that uh, that really uh, required the full complexity of the amalgam, and, uh, and 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 then we also and here I don't will explain uh, I will not explain any any detail. I leave you if you want in, interested to look how we have done it with castle specifications. Uh, there is this paper that we have in Ishkai 2015, and then a more elaborated paper in the Artificial Intelligence Journal, where we have implemented these blending using amalgams to, uh, to invent new cadences in music. So taking different kinds of cadences and combine them to, to create a new cadence or chord progressions. And then beyond uh, the musical domain in the Artificial Intelligence Journal, we have also other examples from mathematics and also the combination of, of uh, specifications of mathematics and of music and uh, making some cross-domain blends that combine a musical concept with a mathematical concept. So, so there's are, there are interesting ideas that we have implemented in the, uh, using this idea of amalgam. And, uh, and finally, what we are doing right now. Uh, so, so right now we are, we are exploring this idea of uh, blending to describe how we make sense of diagrams. And uh, so we have these couple of, pa of papers in the Cognitive Science Conference and also in the Diagrams Conference, where we are exploring how we can use blending and blending modeled as amalgams uh, to describe how we make sense of, of, of a diagram. And what I mean from that is that, for example, when we look at the diagram, for example, in this case, a Hasse diagram that represents some partial order, then um, our claim is that uh, when we look and reasoning reason with this diagram, we bring into, our, into this understanding our embodied experience that we have in, in with the world, what is known as our embodied cognition. Uh, for example, when we look at if A is, uh, is uh, greater than F in this partial order, I will, and I will look if uh, I can create a path or follow a path from A to F, okay? I cannot follow a C to F, so, so I cannot say that C is greater than F, but I can say it because I follow this path from A of B. And this path following is something that we bring into that from our, from our embodied experience of moving about uh, along paths. And the same also, our experience of gravity gives us a notion of verticality, which where we usually say that up is more and uh, down is less. And this is also represented in this Hasse diagram where we put the things that are larger on the top and the things that are lower on the bottom. And this embodied cognition that we bring there, uh, there are in, in cognitive science, there, there are certain um, 
tiny packets of embodied cognition that are known in, in, are called image schemas, and they are, uh, as I said, path or verticality or the fact that we have certain grades or scales in these things or uh, containment. These are called image schemas. And we have tried to model how we make sense of a diagram by taking these image schemas and trying to explain them as the diagram is a blend of a geometric description of, of dots and lines and things. And these image schemas, these basic embodied cognition components that exist in cognitive science. We have some mathematical models of these, and then we create a blend of these two. And these blends of the geometric space with the image schemas is what we call the diagram as we make sense of, the diagram where we bring our embodied cognition to that. And these papers describe a little bit these ideas that we are exploring also now, and that have these categor theoretic um, theory underneath, right? And um, and yeah, so 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 actually, that that brings me to the end. What I wanted to explain, I want to explain that our work uh, is part of a lot of work that is done to use category theory approaches for human cognition. Uh, that maybe goes back to the the work in the fifties by Rosen, where uh, category theory was used to to model biological systems. But then in the 80s, there was also the work by Halford and Wilson to describe different stages of cognitive develop development with different uh, complexities of category theoretical structures. And then many other aspects of cognition, uh, like counting, perception, systematicity, analogy, categorization, memory, spatial relation, navigation, many things have been, uh, uh, category theory has been used to model these aspects of human cognition. And, and our contribution to model conceptual blending also with, with some category theoretic notions is just one contribution more in all these work that has been done. And maybe the, the reason for that is what Eresman and Gómez Ramírez have said, and I put here, their quote is that since category theory tries to uncover and classify the main operations of, um, of the working mathematician and mathematical activity uh, actually reflects some of the main operations that we humans do to make sense of the world, uh, it, is not, it comes not of a surprise that that these operations are in the root of our cognition, of our mental life. And so it follows naturally that, that category theory can be applied to all these uh, uh, different uh, domains and also to cognitive science itself, right? And, um, and uh, yeah, so that, that is the main inspiration also to use category theoretic uh, ideas to model cognitive operations such as conceptual blending. And if you are uh, interested to look at the details, everything that I've explained is in this paper that we have published in Cognitive, Science Re Cognitive Systems Research, and, um, and that describes the details of, of our model for conceptual blending. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was a uh, great you. talk. Uh, that's all I have speaker. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting material here, I think, to ask a variety of questions about. Um, also, a lot of other sort of related work. So, um, so I'll stop the recording for some sort of informal discussion. If anyone has any particular uh, questions they wanted to raise about this work or anything in the talk. Um, Uh, I've got uh, one thought that I can leave with, and then maybe someone else can jump in, um, which is that um, your, your work is um, making use of, and it seems in this tradition of stuff that's making use of this notion of partial maps mm -hmm. that um, are part of the span and with the mono. And, that goes back to the 70s. And mm -hmm. it's a shame uh, P Peter Hofstra, who sometimes comes to these things, isn't, isn't here because he's done a little work 
with a new approach to uh, mm -hmm. uh, partial uh, functions and category theory, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, restriction categories. And I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, the other names associated to that are, uh, the main names are uh, Cockett and uh, Lack uh, up in mm -hmm. Canada and Australia. And um, so as I can send you the reference, uh, it, it might be a bit more abstract and so actually not as computational, but it, it, it might give you a bit of a cleaner setting for some of the more just sort of general formal results you were trying to set to establish. So, thought okay. I that. I don't know if you've seen that or. Okay, so so it's worth to look at. Uh, Andre, you've got your hand up. Jump in. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Gershwin. Sorry, I didn't say hello. Yeah, th thank you, Marco. Very interesting talk. Uh, I, ju I just wonder if this. Um, all construction can be easily dualized. Is there any reason, say, from cognitive science perspective, that blending is more somehow important uh, than uh, dual operation? It's mm -hmm. kind of analysis, right? You you can think about this uh, dualize this uh, batch uh, surgeon example as someone just does distinguish two things and then comes to distinguish this. So, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, and actually, yeah, there, there's no, yeah. So this duality is actually there because it's, there's no, uh, so, so, so creativity, uh, the conceptual blending has been explored very much in computational creativity, for example, as a, as an, because it, it provided a nice way to, to create new things, right? Out of two, two things or two or three or four, create new things and then combine it and create another thing. And so, and to, to have a theory of creation, but, um, but it is also creative to understand a blend. So when you look at the, at the image and you recognize that it is a blend. So you make this decomposition, as you said, you, you, from, you start from the blend and try to figure out what are the, what are the input spaces that generated that, that, that participate in this blend, or what are the input spaces and their relationship that would be the underlying this blend. This direction is also important because that's what happens when we understand, or when, when from cognition we understand a, a, a blend that is given to us. When we see this image of the, of the, of the surgeon budger, and we obviously immediately uh, Find, uh, find the two input spaces that that generate or mental spaces that generate it. So, 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 yeah. I don't want to sound that it is only one directional that we go from from mental spaces to the blend space. So, so this is one way to go. But, but there's also the other way in cognition that we start with the blend, and we, and then we recognize the the spaces the cross space relations and the tensions that exist there that makes this an interesting blend. Yeah. Thank you. But, uh, do we have anyone else that uh, wants to ask anything um, here? Um, I, I have one uh, sort of question that I, I, I think it's just for clarity and I'm sorry I missed this, you probably explained this, is, um, in this setting, when you you showed that you've you you can relate uh, this uh, general notion um, to 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 this sort of more com computationally uh, sort of easy to calculate amalgam. Yes. Um, uh, the, when you take the amalgam, does that does that cut down the space? Because you described when you're in the sort of you know these ordered settings and whatever, um, you can have a lot of different dancers, right? And then you sort of walked us through at least one example with the icons. So, but when you take the amalgam, is that mean that you sort of just like picked one from among the space? Is it like, or does the amalgam sort of let you capture the whole range of stuff that this other thing does? Um, I don't know if I've understood the question, but. Um... So, so obviously, I gave you, uh, for example, the arguments. I give you only one example, but uh, the the obviously there you have a whole space of different amalgams, 
some of them are obviously more general than others. Some are incomparable, and uh, and and so we can th think about uh, the the set of of um, when the, the set of the set of amalgams or the set of near pushouts would be the set of optimal near pushouts that we can compute, and there can be many of them. And uh, obviously, we need to 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 explore the whole space. This needs, from the implementation point of view, to have these generalization operators that allow you to generalize from one object to another. Now, it is it uh, in 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 for example, in description logics, it is we have sure that we can have there's no generalization operator that will be. Uh, that will allow us to explore the entire generalization space. So we will always uh, explore only a subset of this generalization space. And that means that from a computational point of view, we'll always only gener uh, generate a subset of all possible amalgams or near pushouts. Um, and then uh, we need to guide these, these search. And for this, we take inspiration also from the theory of conceptual blending of what they call the optimality principles. So there are certain principles that make certain blends more optimal than others. And these optimality principles, which are also explained in, in an ad hoc natural language way, let's say in the literature, we are trying to give it a formal description so that we can guide the computational exploration and selection of the best blends. But um, uh, it will be always, uh, we will not be able to explore the whole space, at least for, for, for certain, I mean, if, if, it's, it, for, if you have a certain complexity, if you already are with, for example, with descriptions in, in a description logic, you already run into, to, the problems that you cannot explore the whole space. Uh, and so from like uh, uh, the standpoint of, uh, I guess, uh, like thinking about this is a model for actual cognition or something, right? Then there, there, so there's some idea of like, well, part of, you know, how the brain would do it in this model would be actually that it's got its own sort of guiding algorithm that walks through the search space looking for certain things. Is that that one would want to model as well then? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I will not be bold to say that the, the model that we have models the, um, how we, the, the human cognition, but other way around, uh, the other way around, what I want to say is that we use the idea of human cognition of conceptual blending to make an implementation that somehow is as faithful as possible as how we humans create or combine concepts. But I, I cannot say if this is how the brain operates. Uh, I saw one other question I'll feed in that Lou asked much earlier. And so it, it may no longer be relevant because he asked it early on in the talk, but I'll mm -hmm. ask for him, which is he said in the chat, uh, what about blending blends? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that is, that is, uh, Fauconier and Turner call it a mega blend. Uh, mega blends would be blends of blends, but that's like composition of pushouts, right? So, so you, when you combine, when you make composition of pushouts or combination of near pushouts or combination of amalgams, that would be, that would be the blends of blends, right? Uh, does anyone have anything else? Otherwise, I'll uh, stop the recording session and we can chat a bit more informally if people would like. Uh, but uh, let's thank the speaker again for a very interesting uh, talk on introducing us to a lot of uh, ongoing work. Mm -hmm. uh,